Good afternoon. Thank you so much for coming. Um, so there are people from various walks of my life here. Uh, some of my sorrows from uh, Sigma, from uh, oh my God. Some of my sorrows from uh, I, I was inducted into Delta Sigma Theta sorority, 250,000. Uh, mostly African-American college-educated women, um, maybe about six years ago or so. Um, and uh, some of my sorors are here today. Uh, one of the um, executives from the California Science Center, where I served on the board for many years and was um, blessed and fortunate enough to have been the chair of the board, when we signed for the application to NASA to get the Endeavor. Have you seen the Endeavor yet? <laughs> right, so it's over there. Please make sure you, you go. And then when Sarah uh, let me know today that she too is a Vassar alum, I was like, wow, my worlds are colliding. <laughs> um, not to mention the fact that I've now told this little tidbit, uh, I think this is my third time saying it since I've been on this campus for the past, I don't know, hour or so. But my 11-year-old grandson has been coming here every summer since he was seven uh, because uh, he's a Minecrafter. Anybody know what Minecraft is? So at the age of six, he was like a Minecraft freak, and I was very concerned. <laughs> and I said, Idris, I'm, I'm, Grandma's very concerned about the amount of time you're spending on the computer. No, no, Grandma, it's, it's really good. It's fun. I love it. I said, well, do you know somebody is writing those programs to create those games. And he just looked at me. I said, you know, you could learn to write your own programs. He said, what? <laughs> and I said, yeah, it's called coding. Grandma. And I watched his little eyes roll back in his head like he was in ecstasy. And I said, and they have it at UCLA. And so he informed me, when I grow up, I'm going to go to UCLA. And I said, Idris, OK, OK. I said, Idris, that's, that's the only college you've ever been to. Grandma, that's my school. <laughs> so he'll be back this summer. It'll be summer number four. So you may have a budding uh, a Bruin about to be here. But anyway, I want to thank you all so very much. Um, thank you to Christina. Uh, thank you. Uh, Christina has been, uh, where are you? Oh, Christina has been, whether, I mean, from, I've gotten emails from her. China, Jamaica, Toronto, in my bed. <laughs> but I want to thank you so much for your diligence. And I think, I think you must have contacted me, I don't know, months and months and months, maybe even a year ago, to set this up. Um, and to uh, my um, former colleague who was going to be here, Neka Ogumake, but Neka is um, busy with the WNBA. I, um, I want to just say to you that um, the inspiration for me being involved in sports has zero to do with me being athletic. <laughs> Although at the age of 51, I started running marathons. Um, uh, because somebody said, well, you know, diagnosed with diabetes, you, it can be controlled with um, diet and exercise. And I was like, diet, yeah. And they said, they said, I said, why? So I, once I got the explanation of it, and my doctor said, I need for you to lose 20 pounds. But because I'm an overachiever, I lost 25. <laughs> because I didn't like the way he told me I needed to lose 20 pounds. So I told him, the extra five pounds are for you to take and shove. <laughs> You're getting some insight into my personality. And then I heard uh, uh, exercise. I was like, exercise? Yeah. Well, I don't know about that. And then I got here to Los Angeles and was the president and general manager at uh, KNBC, you heard, and I also was the regional general manager for the two Telemundo stations here. So I put the Los Angeles Marathon on the air at NBC4. And it was a gathering kind of like this of organizations that were going to benefit from the philanthropic and charitable um, outcome of the, of the marathon. And I said out loud while ha speaking like this, I said, and I so admire marathoners. I wish I could do that someday. And I you know, took my seat wherever. And this man came over to me. And he said, um, I think you said something that might get you into trouble. 
when you speak publicly, that's about the worst thing you can ever hear, right? <laughs> and I, I, oh, I'm so sorry. I, I don't know what I said, but, I, but let me apologize. He said, well, you said you wished you could run a marathon. I said, well, yeah, I do. He said, well, I can teach you. <laughs> teach me to run? <laughs> Who doesn't know how to run? He said, no, 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 no. Run a marathon. I said, oh, intrigued. He said, it's an eight-month program, but we only have five months. We can start now. And I said, well, how will we start? He said, first, I have to see you run a mile. I said, I can do that. Never run. <laughs> I went home and told my husband, and he said, run? I've only ever seen you run for the train in New York City. You don't run. And I was like, no, no. I'm going to meet him on Saturday, and I'm going to run a mile. He said, Paula, do you know how long a marathon is? <laughs> These, I'm giving you insight into my being before I go into surviving and thriving in this you know, work world, because, because it'll help you understand. So he said, do you know how long a marathon is? I was like 26.2 miles. He said, why don't you start with a 5K? No, stop trying to talk me out of it, and what's a K? <laughs> True story. And he kind of looked at me and said, the same person who said, do you know you're black? Same person who said, baby, I'll help you however I can. I'll help you, I'll help you however I can. But I just want you to think about starting. And I just looked at him. He said, never mind. And he walked away. <laughs> so five months later, I ran my first marathon. And then six months later, I ran the New York Marathon. And then six months after that, I ran the LA Marathon again. Um, and why do I tell you that? I tell you that because now I'm going to launch into surviving and thriving. <clears throat> you saw a picture of my mother. The reason why I wanted that um, short clip from my documentary shared with you is because um, it, it, it just gives you a little bit of insight as to how I grew up and where I grew up. And the fact that my parents were uh, immigrants who I identify as people who, who self-select, right? They make a decision to leave kith and kin, homeland, friends behind, and they go to, most often, a completely new country. Sometimes there are familiar people there to welcome them, and sometimes there's nobody familiar to welcome them. My mother was um, the daughter of a African, Chinese, African Jamaican woman and a Hakka Chinese man who left China at the age of 15 in 1905 to seek, you know, making money in, in Jamaica, which was at that time um, um, extolled in China as a place where, you know, my, my people come from southern China, which is a climate just like the Caribbean, right? So they figure they can go there, they can make money, send money home, and at the conclusion of this indentured contract, return. It didn't happen. And, on the, and actually, while my grandfather was there, he fell in love with black women. <laughs> I like to say, and that produced the beauty of me. <laughs> so my grandfather went there as a young teen, and his parents had every expectation that he would return, because like the other men, who came, uh, generally speaking, these men were older than a 15-year-old. So they had wives and families and children back in China, which was the anchor to bring them back. My grandfather didn't have any of that. So he got to Jamaica and, you know, made money, fell in love, had children. Um, he had two partners who were local women, who were African Jamaican women. They lived in different cities slash towns. And when my grandfather's family in China realized he wasn't coming back anytime soon, they sent a bride sight unseen for him to marry. Um, he did that. And he apparently went to my grandmother and said, I want to raise our daughter with my Chinese wife. And my grandmother probably put her hand on her hip <laughs> and probably did some serious neck movement. And it was like, oh, no. No, because not only was he not marrying her, but he was going to marry a Chinese woman. He wanted their daughter. Not going to happen. So my grandmother's response was, you'll never see her again. And they never saw each other again. So my mother was three years old, never saw her father again. 
and was raised in a very uh, hard and tough life in Jamaica. Fast forward to 1945. 1945, my mother is fortunate enough to leave Jamaica and move to the United States. Now, how did that happen? It happened because she got her passport and a visa and came to the United States. She flew Pan Am to Miami and then took the train from Miami north to New York. But on the way to that, what I learned when I was trying to research my mother's background and actually was looking for her birth certificate in 1918, that she was born in 1918, I never found my mother's birth certificate. I had to pay the Registrar General's office in Jamaica, and they found my mother's birth certificate in no time. It was issued in 1945. 1945. Why would it have been issued in 1945? Because her mother, who abandoned her, uh, never filed a birth certificate. So my mother got a birth certificate in, 19, in January 1945, applied for a visa to come to the United States, uh, received it in March of 1945, and by April of 1945, my mother was on a plane landing in New York, and she never wanted to look back at Jamaica again, which is very surprising to me, because in my history, most Jamaicans will go on and on and on about how much they love the island. I love the island, but for my, for my mother, it was a bit, very painful experience. She had two boys, you saw my brothers, and me. I'm the youngest. I'm the only girl. And in this only girl, my mother instilled every goal that she had that was unfulfilled, that this daughter was to accomplish. Now I'm going to talk about my career. <laughs> my career, I'm not so sure that it was ever really my career. Um, my career was largely established by my mother, who had only gone as far as, far as second form in uh, Jamaican schools in the British system, maybe like seventh grade, uh, was pulled out of school in order to clean people's houses and work on a farm. She was raped at the age of 12. Uh, she never saw her father. So being half Chinese, half Jamaican, that population in Jamaica, generally speaking, was middle class to upper middle class. Because my mother was an abandoned child, and by abandoned, I meant that her father actually searched for her for, for a long time, but could never find her. Her mother didn't want her because the shame of having this child was heavy on my grandmother. So she left her daughter with her mother. My mother grew up with her grandmother, who every day referred to her granddaughter as you half Chinese wretch. When my, when my mother was raped at the age of 12, her grandmother didn't do anything. Now take into account all of this. My father meets my mother. Uh, I'll talk a tiny bit about a color caste system, which exists not only in Jamaica, but here in the United States too, in much of the world. But people who are generally seen as fairer skinned are seen as more beautiful, right? So my father, who was um, African Jamaican with a Scottish grandfather, um, but my mother was very fair-skinned, and you saw she, she actually, my mother did not look black. So this woman growing up in Harlem with three black kids, uh, I will tell you, we became very aware of race at, a, at an early age, my brothers and I. My mother did not want to um, ever get married, but my father's father, my father's father had money. So it kind of, I guess she saw the opportunity and it made sense. Uh, except that they never loved each other. So now she's in the United States. My father wants her. She gets away from him. He stows away. My father is an engineer. He's got an actual formal education. He stows away to get to the United States because the United States was not issuing visas to Jamaicans. This is all going to get very circuitous because Marcus Garvey had been here in the United States and the United States banned Jamaicans from coming here with, with regular visas. So not until 1962, when Jamaica got its independence, did the US really lift this ban on Jamaicans and, and visas. You could get an education visa, but you couldn't get a regular ordinary visa to come here. So my, grandf my father stowed away. He finds my mother. He convinces her to marry him, and immediately their marriage breaks up. And every time they get back together, one of us is born. <laughs> I was raised to not be a girl. 
My mother did not want me to be a girl. Dolls? What do you need dolls for? Get her a Lionel train set. So I had Lionel train set just like my brothers did. I, I made balsa wood airplanes with engines. We flew them. We had um, telescopes and microscopes all while growing up on welfare, right? We had all, because my parents were split. My father said, if I can't have them, I'm not supporting them. So not until my mother took him to court did he support us, right? But the determination of this woman that what happened to me as a woman is never going to happen to my daughter meant that all I ever did was, yes, mommy. Okay, mommy. Yes, mommy. Uh, third grade, I came home with my report card. I was always super smart. I was always a good kid, a little sassy, <laughs> but super smart. And I came home with my report card and I handed it to my mother and my mother looked at it. She flipped it over to the other side and she stared at it again. And she leaned in, not Sheryl Sandberg leaning in. <laughs> she leaned in very close to my face and she was very angry and she said, I did not come to this country for you to get a B. <laughs> yes, mommy. Right? So I was never supposed to get married. I was never supposed to have children. I was supposed to achieve at the highest level of anything that I ever faced or stepped into. That was my mother's expectation. Got into Vassar? Good. That's what I came here for. No, oh my God. This is what it was like. <laughs> you want me to praise you for that? That's what you were supposed to do. Um, I spoke about, uh, let's say, seven or eight months ago at the, Chinese Amer at the um, California um, African American Museum. And I showed my film. And the audience was a little larger than this. And let's say this side of the audience, a lot of black people. And this side of the audience, a lot of Asian people. And there was some mix because people knew each other too. But somebody asked a question and said, Paula, since you are straddling both cultures, you kind of straddle both cultures, yeah. Um, what's the biggest difference between, that you found between black people and Chinese people? I said, oh, I can answer that with a question. They're like, yeah. I said, how many people grew up hearing your parents almost with some frequency say, I love you? All the black people's hands went up. <laughs> are you noticing all the Asians chuckling? All the Asians in this room are chuckling. How many people uh, almost never heard your parent, the parents say, I love you? All the Asian hands went up, and mine. And the black people were going, what? Because in that culture, there's no praise for you. No praise for Of course I love you. Don't be stupid. I let you live under my roof. I feed you. I send you to school. Don't be stupid. Bring me home an A. That's it. That is it. So when I told my mother, no, I was not going to go to medical school because I'm not the science-oriented person, I was worthless. And then my daughter announced she was going to be a doctor. Now I had value again. <laughs> right? I told my mother I was getting married. Married? Why you want to marry him? Why you want to marry him? Ma, because I love him. No, you don't. No, you don't, right? Live with him first. You will find out you hate him. <laughs> you want me to shack? Yes. Yes. I got married. She was angry. I got pregnant. And then what happened, it was always happens. The baby's born, my mother's in love. Oh, so nice. My mother moved to live with us to raise her child. <laughs> right. When I got my first job, right, my mother I was a newspaper reporter, and my mother wanted to understand without saying, how can I help? Because there's no how can I help, right? That, that, that's not a conversation that happens. But I needed childcare. Well, nobody's gonna care for her child, her grandchild except her, so my mother moved in, right? So my mother moved in. How did my career get launched? Because not too long after, I got divorced. How did my career get launched, and how did it remain solid? because my mother took care of everything at home. She didn't, she didn't 
drive and she wasn't going to go out on the subway by herself and none of that. But in terms of taking care of my daughter and taking that pain off my brain, that concern, that three o'clock, did you get home on time? Is everything okay? My daughter was never a latchkey kid. My mother covered all of that because I was supposed to be great. I am going to be an excellent executive and anything my mother can do, although she understood none of this, whatever she could do to make it easier on me, she was going to do. And so, trying one day to impress her, which was <laughs> impossible, right? Impossible to impress her. Uh, the longest tenured television reporter in New York was a gentleman named Gabe Pressman, who passed last year at the age of 92. And I became news director for NBC in New York. I ran the news department, and one night, I was getting a ride home from Gabe, and I knew my mother, who was a news junkie, my mother could tell you anything and everything about news. She taught us to read when, she, when we were three years old. My mother didn't know you're not supposed to teach kids to read, when you, because who told her that? So she didn't know you're not supposed to teach kids to read when they're three years old, and she didn't know that kids aren't supposed to read the Herald Tribune. <laughs> so we learned to read, reading the Herald Tribune at the age of three. Um, but she knew Gabe Pressman, and she was so impressed with him. So I said, Gabe, can you, can you, come, can you just come in my house and say hi to my mom? Sure. Well, my mother. <laughs> she looked at me, I was like. <laughs> she said, Gabe Pressman, I watch you on television. I've been watching you. He says, Mrs. He says, Mrs. Williams, I just want you to know your daughter is just about the best boss I've ever had. <gasps> I said, yes, I'm his boss. <laughs> Then I had meaning. <laughs> so I was emboldened enough. So shortly thereafter, I went home. And you know, in the old days when you used to actually get a pay stub, I took my paycheck. Ma. And she looked at, what is this? That's oh, my paycheck. I get it every two weeks from NBC. She looked at it, her eyes. She said, they pay you this much for doing that? <laughs> I said, Ma, you don't have to be a doctor or a scientist. Yes, you do. But they pay you this? I said, yes. Now, 16 years old, a guy wants to take me out on a date. My mother is not pleased about this. She says, OK, OK. He takes you to the movies. If you want to see him again, you pay the next time. Why? Guys pay. No, no. If you let the guy pay all the time, he will think that he has a right to you. you he pays the first time, you pay the next time. You don't owe him anything. Why did I tell that story? My mother had no idea that it was actually all those sayings that she put in my head and those insistences on, I did not come to this country for you to get a B, all added up to my focus. My mother was eternally a sad person. She was never a happy person. And because she always talked about the importance of family, nobody is more important than your family, I concluded at the age of six that in order to make my mother happy, I was going to have to find her family. At the age of six, I promised myself I was going to find my mother's father. When I got my first job, my first paying job, at the age of 21, I learned retirement is 65. That's retirement age. Seven was my lucky number. I don't know why. It isn't anymore, but I don't know why. I subtracted seven from 65 when I was 21, and I came up with the number 58. When I was 21, I decided I would retire when I was 58, because that would make me still young enough to find my grandfather and or his people. I retired at the age of 58. I put out into the, into the atmosphere and to my father's African Jamaican family, because my mother didn't have much family. And I said, I'm looking for the Chinese people in my family. I'm trying to find my grandfather's people. And once I did that, probably six months later, I was sitting in China meeting my mother's 94-year-old sister and 88-year-old brother. 
Um, that's not what this talk is about. But this talk is to tell you that I had a focus from childhood. I had a reason for why I made the career moves I did. I made decisions about how I would and would not interact with men, how I would and would not interact with women, the kind of supervisor I would be, the demand for excellence, but the understanding that everybody can't always achieve that. Um, I had a brother, but one of, my, one of my brothers for many years was a drug addict. And I watched my mother in some ways penalize the rest of us in order to give him what he needed. But today he's fully productive and wonderful and is a great guy and the brother I love and all. But I learned how to suspend a lot of the demand for it has to be perfect just because you're out of consideration for somebody. Maybe they're not every, and I learned last year that my brother actually has ADD. I never knew that, and he never knew that. And how did he find this out? Because his grandson was struggling in school, so he had to be diagnosed. And so what happened? They diagnosed the whole family. So my, my niece, my brother's daughter, who's a very successful businesswoman, has ADD. She and her daughter and I comprise the family that is the first Asian or uh, black family at Vassar College to graduate three generations. Well, thank you. But I tell you that because my niece and her daughter both have ADD, and it was only just diagnosed. Uh, the, 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 the learnings that I was able to get, you know, the importance of who you are and who you must be. Why did we buy the Sparks? I didn't play basketball. I dated basketball players <laughs> in college. But I, but I bought the team because it went something like this. Without NBC knowing it, my family had become independently wealthy. And I say without NBC knowing it because it was none of their business. Um, but when I became um, executive vice president for diversity, which was a enterprise-wide job, I had to declare. I had to go and tell them because, you know, we owned the Africa Channel, NBC is television. Uh, we owned the Sparks, NBC covers sports. Uh, we had other stuff, and NBC had stuff. So I had to let them know so there wasn't going to be a conflict of interest. And, and I, I bought the Sparks because while I was at NBC as chief diversity officer, we had these investments. Someone came to us and asked us if we wanted to invest in the Los Angeles Sparks. No, we watch basketball, but we don't, own, we don't know how to run a team. And then the very next week, Don Imus called, oh, people know. The Rutgers women's basketball team, what? Nappy-headed. And I was still working at NBC, and I was about to announce my retirement, and I was offended. And so I went to the, uh, the CEO, who had, a few days before, asked me to take on the job of chief diversity officer, which I said no to. No, I don't want to do that. That's a consulting job. I'm not good as a consultant. I'm really good at telling people what to do. I like for people, if, I, if we have the conversation and we agree and they tell me and I like what they've said and it's going to happen, we do it. I don't like it just lingering and lingering and just, I don't like it. It makes, and I'm, I'm really bad. I'm really bad when, it's been a long time since I've been bored, but I'm really bad when, I, we, when we think it's a good plan and then no, we're just not going to do it. I start thinking of bad things, um, like how I'm going to pay you back. <laughs> so, um, I went to him and I said, so how come uh, you didn't talk to me about uh, Don Imus and what you're going to do? He said, oh, well, I'm talking to you now. I said, well, you need to get rid of him. NBC needs to terminate the contract. I'm sure you've not heard this from just me. Um, I said, but I've decided there's so much still yet to be done in the company. I'll stay, but he has to be gone. So he was gone. And I stayed. And, and I, because he said what he said, I went to all the little kids in my family and asked them, do you guys want to own a basketball team? That's as much brilliance as it took. 
you guys want to own a basketball team? They're like nine and 11, and they're three 14-year-olds, and they're like, yeah! And I said, okay, we're gonna buy the Sparks. Yeah! So we bought the Sparks. Uh, and I did it. It was probably the only time I made a truly emotional decision. I did it because I was outraged that anyone would refer to women, young women, 19, 20, 20 years old, like that. And I was very, very concerned that the WNBA was kind of struggling and somebody that I thought it was incumbent upon those of us who could to do something. And that's how and why we bought the team. And I, we had a great run and then I eventually sold the team to Magic Johnson. Um, because it really wasn't making money. It was difficult. I mean, if given a choice, many of you in the room, or if not you in particular, but let's say the, the more general you would go to a NCAA game before you'll go to a WNBA game. That's just true across the league. And so the owners of the WNBA rarely do make a profit. And, you know, I like business, but business equals making money. Uh, so I sold it to Magic because I thought he had deeper pockets and could, you know, amortize in ways that I couldn't and so forth. So um, I'm going to do a dog leg here to the hashtag Me Too movement. Kind of. So the first time I was propositioned by a boss was on my very first job. I was a reporter in Syracuse, New York, and it was a Christmas party. And I went down the hall to get something and the editor said something to me which mortified me. Something like, I've been admiring your legs. Something like that. And I vowed at that point that I was never gonna to go to another company event where there was drinking going on if my spouse wasn't present or if a date wasn't present or if, a, if I didn't have a female buddy, somebody to be with me so that I didn't put myself in that position again. So I didn't tell anybody about it because He's the executive editor of the newspaper. Who, you know, who am I going to tell? And I'm 23 years old. Who am I going to tell? But I, my strategy was, OK, don't put myself in that position again. It's almost impossible to not put yourself in such a position. Because wherever you work, you can't always get somebody to go with you to the supply closet to get more paper clips, right? It doesn't work that way. You can't always, if, if, if the boss calls you in and wants to have a one-on-one, -on -one, you can't always say, no, 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 I can't come in alone, I have to bring, it's just not done that way, right? But I can tell you that one of the final ones that occurred happened when I was in my 50s. And I was already really highly ranked in the company. And someone made, in fact, it was a boss, made a direct overture to me. And I tried to figure out how to squash this person like a bug. So here's how the scenario went. Paula, you know that trip we're taking next week to da 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 da? Yeah. Did you make your reservations yet, your airline reservations? No, not yet. I mean, you know, I was just. You know, I was living in New York. I was going to take the shuttle. You know, they leave every half hour. I said, no, I hadn't made reservations yet. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. My assistant will take care of those. We'll make the reservations for you and me. I was like, oh, OK, thanks. Well, did you make your hotel room reservations yet? No. And in my, I have parallel, right? I'm talking to myself going, how stupid is that? If I didn't make my airline reservations, of course I didn't make my hotel reservations. But my, that was inside. Outside, I said, no, not yet. He said, oh, don't worry. My assistant will take care of that, too. I said, OK. He said, you're going to be staying with me. I said, oh, in the same hotel? He said, no, in my same room. I, who have a bit of sass, said, hmm, have you ever seen my husband? I was like, oh, yeah, I've seen him. And I'm, this is going to be really offensive. But like I said, I needed to squash him like a bug. I said, you've seen my husband, right? Right. In my whole life, I've never ugly. And I'm not going to start now. And certainly not with you. <laughs> oh my god, Paula, oh my god, I was joking. I said, yeah, me too. <laughs> That's my hashtag me too story. Um, 
I don't claim that everyone has the experience of being raised by a mother who raised me to not be what she saw as wearing pink things and frilly stuff, right? Um, and I use those as metaphors for, I mean, you understand. My, but my mother really railed if her granddaughter showed up all in pink. Why are you dressing her like that? I mean, she really, it was like, no, no. And she, my mother saw through things in ways that I think a lot of people didn't. Even her warning to me about going on a date and not getting the mindset that it is the man who pays for everything. Even telling me, what is that work you're doing? That's not real work. Well, imagine that, however, I am still trying to prove to my mother, OK, I'm not a doctor, but I'm a boss. And here's this guy who you think is like, and I'm his boss. My mother's like, OK, OK but always striving, striving, striving. It doesn't have to be that way for everyone, but I can't tell you, I can't tell you how many young women and middle-aged women and senior women who have come to me and asked for advice about career moves, and when I listen to them, what I realize is they have been immobilized by fear, afraid of stepping out and taking the risk and being noticed. But how do you get promoted? How do you get elevated to the next thing if you're not noticed? You have to figure out how to stand out and also how to strap on that armor. I've tried to explain to my sisters in the workplace, covet power. Don't pull away from power as though, ooh, that's really not for me. No, 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 no. Go for it. Go for power. And when you get it, think of it like a tracksuit. Put it on. Go for a run in it. Wiggle around on the ground in it. Get comfortable in it. Take a nap in it. Wake up and sleep in it and run in it. Because until you get comfortable with power, people are going to be able to put you under their thumbs. You don't even know when it's happening, but you shy away from, like, ooh, no. And power doesn't mean you're lording it over everybody. My definition of power is that I have mentored and raised up so many other women executives and male executives, but it's the women executives who I actually have to nurture a bit more, I think, right? And then what I say to them is, I can't take on any more mentees but I'm mentoring you and here's what you have to promise. I'm gonna call you up and I'm gonna give you somebody's name and you have to promise to mentor her. If I'm gonna do it for you, you have to pay it forward. That, the, that's the deal, that's the deal. One of my best friends asked me one day, Paula, how did your family get so wealthy and my family had more money than yours and we grew up the same way and, and we didn't get wealthy? And I said, ooh. So first of all, I was a little taken aback by that. But then I realized it was a genuine question. I said to her, have you ever given anybody in your family a chunk of money? She said, yeah, I just gave my niece like $10,000 for a down payment for mortgage for a house. And I said, tell me the speech you gave her when you gave her the money. I just told her that I hoped it would be helpful and I'm happy to be able to do it. I said, that's not the speech in my family. I said, my family's speech is, so here's the money. You don't have to give it back to me. But you got to accumulate it because somebody else in the family is going to need that money, and you better have the $10,000 to give it to the next person. And she looked at me, and I said, and that's how we got wealthy, because it's a sense of responsibility. There's no free ride. You must fulfill your responsibilities, right? And so in the workplace and the strategy for thriving, I have been so outspoken. People who know me, I've been outspoken, and I've said things in corporate settings that people go, not profanity, right? But I was in a meeting with NBC Universal executives, and I, and I said out loud, I will consider my role as chief diversity officer to be, have been successful the day you all cast an, an Asian man as a romantic lead. They're like, what? I said, 
that you cast an Asian man as a romantic lead? I said, because you're always casting them as the, as the crazy scientist or the crazy spy guy who wants to blow up the world. Always emasculated. They were like, I said, well, you know what the most populated nation on the planet is? China. You know who's fathering children in China? Chinese men. Why can't a Chinese or an Asian man pick one? I don't care. Romantic lead. And they looked at me, I said, and by the way, my grandfather was Chinese. He had two black women and a Chinese wife. They look, I said, I know. It's a little much to take in. <laughs> it is a little much to take in, but I, 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 am, I am alluding to the ability to be rom You have to break those stereotypes that you see and you have. So they were like, well. So I say outrageous things like that, right? But then on the other hand, someone asked me, have you ever been fired? No. Have you ever applied for a job the first time? Why? Because I'm successful in business. And all those p women that I was telling you I elevated, they are CEOs and they're presidents. I don't take credit for anything anybody else has done. I will call the executives and say, you got to pay attention to Jennifer. Jennifer is outstanding. She's amazing. And she came up with such and such and such. My experience was people tried to take credit for what I did, right? And that's how I learned, don't do that. Because it makes that person hateful. It made me hateful. It made me go, I'm going to pay you back in my head. On the outside, I'd like, hi, how are you, right? But that same person, Jennifer, I'm talking about, when someone who was in the NBA was looking for a chief financial officer, Jennifer said, I'm think, I think I'm going to apply for this job at the Golden State Warriors. And I was like, cool. I said, I know the owner. She said, really? I, said, I called him up. I said, if I had a business that was the size of yours, I would hire her again. She doesn't work for me anymore because I retired. But I, and Jennifer became the first Asian, not Asian woman, the first Asian chief financial officer in the NBA. For who? The Golden State Warriors. And when did she get a championship ring? Nine months later. And what she, same thing. So I have a sisterhood of we're going to help each other. We have to lift each other. But there is a responsibility back where you have to educate and elevate and promote. You have to say other people's names. You have to put them up for jobs. You, you have to. And then on the other hand, when I have interns, I ask them to mentor me. I'm not, I don't have all the answers by any stretch of the imagination. Right? But you mentor me and tell me what's new that I don't know that's cutting edge and so forth. And so, you know, I'm actually pretty good at social media. I'm pretty good at IT. I'm pretty good at current things because I stay in touch with people who I mentored and they tell me all kinds of new, they tell me to get this app, and I do. And sometimes I delete it. <laughs> but it's always about growing and learning and thinking. So if I can if I can impart to you about a strategy for striving and thriving, all, everything I said just now is what all, I think, went into making me successful, right? And the very final thing, and I'll take some questions, the very final thing is I was having a, I was speaking to a group of Wall Street women executives, and I said to them, so um, how many of you get annual reviews? So Rachel, how many get annual reviews? OK. Um, and I said, I would get an annual review, but I would have reviews quarterly. And they were like, what? I said, because once a quarter, I would go to my immediate supervisor and ask, you got five minutes? Sure, what's up? Uh, how am I doing? How did I do on this project? How am I doing that? I mean, can you give me some feedback? And they'd be right, like, whoa. It doesn't have to be long and involved. Just tell me how you think I'm doing. Give me some pointers. So they give you the pointers, you use those and improve, and take those and improve upon. I do that every quarter. I did that every quarter when I worked. I do that every quarter. And then when the time comes for my annual review, guess what we talk about? My future. So what do you think is the next step for me? That's how come I've never had to apply for a job. Somebody, my boss always tells me, you'd be great for that. I think you should. I was, 
news director in New York. I was afraid of earthquakes in California. <laughs> and my boss, my boss's boss called me and said, are you gonna apply for the job at KNBC? I said, what job? He said, the president job. I said, I hadn't planned on it. I said, but now that you're calling me, I guess I should. He said, well, you should think about it. And I said, really? He said, yes. I said, but everybody else who has that job comes out of sales. And I come out of news. He said, don't, don't let that deter you. I applied for the job. A couple of weeks later, I was sitting with Bob Wright, who was the chairman of NBC. He said, you got my vote. And I was like, great. He said, nope, but we got to wait for Jack. Wait for Jack? Yeah, Jack Welch has to decide. Why? Because KNBC is the second largest station, but it's the one that interacts with Hollywood. And I was the first black, not the first woman, but I was the first black, the first black woman to have such a role. That's not why Jack had to sign off on it. Jack had to sign off on it because it would have made me a General Electric company officer, right? I had no surprise about that because I researched all of that ahead of time. And what I learned was that as a GE company officer, I was entitled to retirement at the age of 62 at a pension that was half my compensation. It's like, I'm gonna get that job, <laughs> right? That's how I made those decisions about what jobs to take and what job to go after. And that's how I was able to fund that documentary. Hap happened to, ha we were able to uh, finance my brother's business, which was capitalized at $500 million. That's how we took 22 people in my family to China to find our family, all traveling business class. They thought we were a conference. And I decided if I was gonna take my family to China, I was gonna do it in such a way that everybody always wants to go back. And so right now I'm finishing the screenplay for the film, Finding Samuel O, a feature film that we've been having uh, some actually absolute wonderful conversations with and we've been working with, no promises yet, but we've been working with Viola Davis's production company in order to produce the film. So we'll be going out for funding for the film in about uh, four or five months and I hope that in about two years you'll see on the big screen a Chinese man making passionate love. <laughs> to an African-Jamaican woman. Thank you. We have time for one or two questions. Anybody have any questions? Yes. Eventually I did. Uh, he was just about at the age of retirement. Um, what I knew was that he had made such advances on numerous occasions to other women. Uh, and I knew, I personally knew that some women had been, had received settlements. The mode at that time was really that, well, the only, the only thing that'll really happen is if the person is, high up enough, you might get a settlement. And you have to sign non-disclosure, you'll get a settlement. I wasn't interested in any of that. What I was most interested in, I was offended. I was the how dare you. I was the I'm going to crush you. And so eventually, I think um, in a few months after that, his career took a not great turn. Um, I had I didn't go to HR to report it, but I did tell some very strategically high placed people what he'd said. And um, I think ultimately the organization recognizes that if he's gonna say something like that to me, who at that point, I already had rank in the company, right? It's like, you, so, so I think they thought he'd lost his mind. Um, and I think if I were to do it today, if, I think if that were to happen to me today in this climate uh, where people are, are, I think, being more believed, I would go to HR. But I think, I think for a lot of us, HR is taking on a different tone. Um, because I think HR w walks a very fine line between advocating for the company and advocating for the employee. 
right? But I think with all of this that has happened, many more companies are realizing that in order to maintain um, the caliber of people who you want and the quality of an organization that you want, you can't let that go unaddressed. But for so many years, it, it was undressed, unaddressed. Anybody else? Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs>